and rationalize whenever you think you may be doing something that goes against your values. You will rationalize all the reason why it's okay. You're not there to protect them to build their self self interest. It's about your own self interest, and you're building that muscle memory to say, "Wait a minute, am I a people pleaser? Am I rationalizing all these things?" It, the more self aware you become, the better. Martin Salama is known as the architect of the Warrior's Life Code. He specializes in helping people who are frustrated in their life to quickly shift their mindset to uncover their greatness, so that they can live their true potential and enjoy life. This will be a conversation about how you can make the best of life. This will be a conversation with actual strategies to help you to move from being worried to being. A warrior. So, when you take away something of value from this conversation with Martin, all that we ask is you share this show, this episode, with just one other person who could use it as well. Martin, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm looking forward to it too. Right here from New York, we've got a local in the house, kind of a local. I'm in upstate. You're in you're in metropolitan New York, which is awesome. Right. You're in Brooklyn, you said, right? Brooklyn. Very cool. Born and raised, Brooklyn. Born and raised for about 20 plus years. I lived in New Jersey, not too far, about an hour away down by yeah. the shore. And after my divorce, I came back to this area. Gotcha. Very cool. So let me ask you, when did you become an architect of the warrior life code? So I would say that it started in about 2015, 2014, 2015 is when I started that. But it happened because of everything that my life had gotten to me till that point. And what, what did that look like? So if you can give us a time frame, who was Martin before and who was Martin afterwards? Right, right. So, and let me start when I was younger, when I was 10 years old, it kind of set my path for the next 40 years almost. So when I was 10, uh, we had a tragedy in my family. I have four older sisters and I was walking home one day with one of my four older sisters. Uh, and as we got to our block from, we were coming home from school. Uh, the school, there was a school bus stopped right in front of our house. And we thought that was a little strange. And then as we got closer, we realized the school bus driver was standing on the sidewalk. We're like, okay. Now we get a few steps closer and we see my mother running out of the house, carrying my five-year-old brother, Michael, in her arms, jumps in the car and drives away. Now we, we were freaking out. We didn't know what was going on. We've come to find out that when my brother, Michael, got off the bus, he dropped something right in front of the bus. And as a five-year-old, he went down to pick it up. But the bus driver looked and didn't see him. Mm -hmm. So he drove. And he unfortunately, he hit my brother. And four days later, Michael passed away from his injuries. Wow. So what happened to me at that moment as a 10-year-old, I, I don't think anybody told this to me, but I think I told myself a story. I've lost my brother. This was the guy that I was going to set the world on fire with, you know, that the brothers, we're going to do everything together. We're going to be comrades and for all the sisters. So here I am. It's my job now to carry on the legacy of the name. It's my job to carry on and make sure that everything, you know, like that. And it's my job to make sure that my parents never feel sadness like this again. Yeah. So at that moment, I can look back now it took me a long time to recognize it. But at that moment, I became a people pleaser. Mm. Right. And what comes with being a people pleaser for me was number one, every time I was doing things to pe please people, I wanted to make sure that they recognized me and said, Martin, what a great job you're doing. Yeah. Right. Number two, I took everything personally. So if they said you're not doing a good job, I took that to heart. I was a control freak. And then you add all to that. I had a very short temper. Which, if you think about it, it, all makes sense because here I am trying to make sure that everybody's happy. So I've got to control everything. I've got to make sure that it's going the way I want it to. When it doesn't, I'm taking it personally and I'm getting upset. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'm not going to get the recognition I'm looking for. Yeah. So I didn't know that this was my became my default tendencies until many years later. So imagine this: I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I get married. I'm trying to make my wife happy. I'm trying to make my family happy. And I realized that I'm not making anybody happy, but it wasn't until many years later, because all the time I'm doing these things, I'm thinking, okay, 
I'll, I'm, I was, I would rationalize that what I was doing was for the greater good. Yeah. But it took me a few years to figure out 40 years, almost to figure out that those things weren't working. And what I realized now, and this is part of my course and is something that I've, uh, I've worked on trademarking rationalize is really two words, rational lies. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Of course. And I'll show it to you now another way. Uh, I have come up with a card deck, okay, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's called the warrior to warrior card deck and rationalize. Whenever you think you may be doing something that goes against your values, you will rationalize all the reason why it's okay. What you're mm. doing is lying to yourself that it's rational to think that they are nothing more than rational lies. Is there ever a good time to rationalize? I wonder, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There could be, there could be. But for example, you woke up this morning, you decided, you know what? I'm just too tired to exercise. Yeah. So, okay. If you think about it, you're rationalizing. And what you're doing is you're telling yourself a rational lives. Okay, I'm tired, so I won't exercise. But if you pushed through it and did it, you'd feel better after about 10 minutes of exercising. That I made yes. the right decision. Yep. Every so day. now, every time I'm doing something, I ask myself, is this a rational lie? Am I giving myself permission to get out of something or to do something because even though it goes against my core value? Yes. You know, on a deeper level, am I doing it because I want to please others? Right. Instead of pleasing myself. You described me to a T. I mean, when I was in my late teens, especially when I got into sales, I was a hardcore people pleaser to the point where I was a combination of people pleaser and cocky at the same time. So when I was selling and the other people around me who were sometimes twice my age would sell at a much lesser level, I would want to help them. And I'd try to give them tips and strategies and advice. And I'd be like, why aren't you doing this? You should do it this way, trying to help them. And when I did help them, like you said, I would look for that validation of, oh, Brandon helped me to make this sale when otherwise I might not right. have. So I, I struggled with that. And there's still many points in my life where I still struggle with being a people pleaser, especially when it comes to telling other people no. But I feel that I've personally gotten better at the the idea of taking rationalize and splitting it in two rational yeah. lies. And we talked about this before on the show in terms of negotiating with yourself on why it's okay for you to do this thing that may not actually serve you. Exactly. So here I've taken it and I've, I've encapsulated it even more by saying, just break it down to two words, rational lies. You know, <laughs> Am I telling myself a rational lie? Am I giving myself permission to do something I shouldn't be giving myself permission to do? Now, is it that easy? So once you ask no. yourself, am I, am, I, am, am I making a rational lie right now? Is it easy, as easy as to say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that thing now because I've consciously realized it's not in my best interest? It's not. It's not. <laughs> but now that we've planted the seed, you're more aware of it. Okay. Fair. Now, do I, could I say that I never rationalize? No. But I think that it's went from a, a 90 something plus percentage to under 10%. Wow. Right. But it comes with practice. It comes with you looking in yourself and saying, okay, did I just rationalize? And did I, if I did the first time you do it, you go, okay, I did it. But now you're saying, am I telling myself a rational lie? Well, yeah, I am, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then the next time you may get a little further and say, maybe not. And you're building that muscle memory to say, wait a minute. Am I a people pleaser? Am I rationalizing? All these things. It, the more self-aware you become, the better. And part of what I do in my, in my coaching course, which I'll get into a little bit, is I help people switch, go from self-conscious to self-aware. Mm. What's the difference between being, being self-conscious and being self-aware? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have a card on that too. <laughs> okay, so here's the card on that, self-conscious to self-aware. And I'll read just a little bit of it. Self-conscious comes from a place of negative energy, guilt, conflict, and doubt. Self-conscious is more outward directed. It's being more concerned about what others are thinking of you and how the situation is going to affect you. Mm. You probably react to uncomfortable situations instead of respond. There's a little more, but then you get the gist. Self-awareness comes from a place of positive energy, acceptance, contentment, and self-assuredness. 
Self-awareness is more inward facing. You have an accurate and realistic understanding of how you are responding to situations and how you feel about things. I like that. That's a big difference. Right. So imagine you make that switch and that switch comes over time and you go, okay, now I'm self-conscious. I just did this thing. I know I should have done it. I'm doing it for other people. The next time, maybe a little less and a little less to the point where you go, okay, it's all about Zen. <laughs> it was, it's all about being well con, con, contented within myself. And for me, it started when I went through coaching with me just saying, okay, if I'm not going to be a people pleaser anymore, now I consider myself a recovering people pleaser. You know? <laughs> yeah, recovering alcoholics, gamblers. I'm a recovering people pleaser because there's times I might slip. But if I'm not going to be a people pleaser, what does that mean to me? That means that I'm going to take care of myself first as long as I'm not hurting anybody else in the process. That hmm. was my narrative to myself 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago when I decided this journey. So let me ask you a follow-up on that. As a people pleaser, a recovering people pleaser, how do you then, like what, let me ask you this personally, mm -hmm. what actual changes in your actions did you take once you started to prioritize yourself rather than, rather while not hurting other people. So what, what does it look like to prioritize self as long as it's not hurting other people? Right. So let me start with, um, while I was going through a divorce. Okay. Um, which is part of my story a little bit, but just to answer this question specifically, she would call me up and she'd say, you know, I, this is going on and that's going on and whatever. And I need you to do this for this reason. So part of me was still looking for me to, get her to love me. I didn't want the divorce. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, if I do this for her, maybe she'll look at me better as a result. So now I had to say to myself, am I serving myself or am I serving her? Right? So I would look at the situation and say, wait a minute, this is me trying to be in the codependent relationship again. And that's all about making sure the other one's happy and all that. I can't do that. So my answer would be no. And for her, that was hard for her to hear because I would say no in our relationship, but eventually I would give in. And that had nothing to do with her. It had to do with my lack of self-worth mm -hmm. and my fear of her not loving me. Yes. So I would do it for those reasons. Now that I was aware of it and it came through going through coaching and through other things. And me recognizing that I needed to admit that I needed to change the things that weren't working. So it hurt in the beginning and it was tough and I struggled with it. I really did. But if I really wanted to become somebody who I can say was my authentic self, I had to, I had to make those changes. So when you would answer her in a way that you knew would be upsetting for her, is there a difference between something upsetting someone and something hurting someone? Yeah. Yeah, because you have to look at the greater picture and say, what is the, what is her goal, that other person's goal in this, right? Is it to satisfy her and make sure that she, I'm, I'm taking care of her needs? Or down the road, is it going to have a, 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 or is it a, something that will really hurt them? You know, come pick me up or I'm going to jail. Oh, that's something. Okay, that's going to hurt them. <laughs> that didn't happen. I'm just using that <laughs> as an example, you know. Or come pick me up because I, I, I'm stuck here and I can't find any other way to get here. My car door broke down. I'm not your husband anymore. And yes. that didn't happen either. I'm just using this as an example. Yes. You assess the situation. There's context involved. Right. So the decision may be different depending on the situation itself. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's powerful. And I think that's helpful to all people out there who may be thinking to themselves, I am a people pleaser. How can I begin to take steps towards not being that in my life? And, and it's really important what you just said. You may end up still upset that person emotionally, yeah. but you're doing what is in their best interest for the long term. Right. But more importantly, it's about your best interest. If their best interest gets served as well in the long term, great. But you're not there to protect them, to build their self-interest. Self it's about your own self-interest. And, you know, like I said, then the next level is as long as they're not getting hurt by my actions, then that's all that matters. 
Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, so let me ask you this. When did you create this idea of becoming a life warrior? And when do you believe you became a life warrior yourself? Right. So it, in 2008, so my wife came to me in about 2003 and said, you're just closing a business. You're looking to do something else. I have an idea for you. I'm starting playing tennis. I can never find a tennis court. There's never time for time. There's never court time available. Maybe we should open up some tennis courts as a way of doing something. And now this was in New Jersey. So I'm like, okay, deep down inside, it was the people pleaser again. Cause really I, I never played sports, <laughs> Yeah, but I'm like, okay. So we start down this five year journey of deciding whether of, of deciding to build a tennis court. So we go out and we get a feasibility study and the feasibility study says, yeah, there's a place for you to have tennis courts there, but you won't make money only from tennis courts. Mm. because it's not enough to sustain it. You need to build a health club. You need to do all these other things. So what started out as an idea of let's find something. Now we have to find the land. We have to find the architects. We have to find the engineers. We have to go through the town. It took us five years. And what started as tennis courts turned into a hundred plus thousand square foot tennis and a uh, health club facility. And it took us five years to get all of those things in place and then getting the city to say, okay. Yeah. And three plus million dollars, close to three and a half million dollars of my money and other people's money invested. So now if it was 2006, 2007, I go to the bank, I'll go, okay, okay, great. Well, here's the money, go. But it was 2008, mm. all right? And it's the summer of 2008. We go to the bank, we're like, okay, we're ready. And they go, well, we're not lending right now. Things are slowing down. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, it's just not the way it used to be. Month later, Bernie Madoff, subprime loans, the world goes upside down and me with it <laughs> overnight. I was broke. Right? I stopped paying my mortgage. I stopped paying my car payments. A couple of months later, my son says, dad, dad, look, your car's being towed. Wow. I was being repossessed. My car was being repossessed. That never happened to me before. The house was eventually foreclosed on. Luckily I lived in New Jersey where there was such a backlog because of what happened in 2008 that it took a while till we were thrown out of our house. Wow. Right? So now, about a year later, I'm like, okay, I got to pick myself up. I got to figure out what I'm going to do now. And I decided I was tired of being that businessman. And I looked into my life and I said, the best times I had was when I was a leader of different community organizations. And as the leader, people come to you and say, well, I don't know what I can do. I said, let me show you what you can do in the few hours you're going to give me. And I realized I was a life coach mm. without really being one. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'll go into life coaching. So now life coaching, I find a place and I'm, I'm going to go to it. And two months before life coaching, it's my 24th wedding anniversary, which happened to be the day after Valentine's Day. Yeah. And my wife says to me, I'm done. I want a divorce. So I mentioned to you that I was divorced. So that came and that hit me down again. I was like, I can't catch a freaking break. <laughs> how, by the way, just for context, how long after the 2008 crisis did that occur? About a year, almost a year and a half later. Pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it, it happened in, uh, in September, 2008, the whole thing, right? By February, 2010. So mm -hmm. it's a year plus a few more months. That's when it happened. Got it. Right. Cause I said it was a, it was a, what you would call it? Um, Valentine's day. Yes. So now I'm like, okay. And I had this tugging feeling inside of me. And really now it's God. I look at it as it was God saying, oh, you want to go to life coaching? Well, let's make sure you really get what's got to go on there. And you're down and you got to figure out what to go on. So I walk into, and they, before I get there, they hand us a, a list of books and they say, read two or three of these books. And one of them was The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Who gave you these books? The school gave me a list of books, the, okay. the, the coaching school. Got said, it. Read a couple of these books. Great book, by the way. Right. And I read the second agreement, which is don't take anything personally. Mm. I was like, whoa. Yeah. That's difficult. It's like he told me a secret that the world had been telling me my whole life. But until that minute, I wasn't ready to hear it. I was like, wait a minute. I don't have to be responsible for everybody. I don't have to take things personally. If somebody calls me an idiot, it may not be about me. It may be about them. <laughs> yeah. 
It's so difficult though to like, it's so true. And when I do, like you mentioned earlier, when you have that awareness of they're not attacking me, this is likely something to do with them. It's almost that ego in us wants to be attacked. It wants to be, it wants to be in this altercation. Like what were you taking personally at the time where reading that rule helped put things in a different perspective? I was taking, I, I was taking the divorce personally. I was taking that I lost everything in my life personally, that the 2008 crash was happened to me. (laughs) Yeah. It really had happened to everybody. (laughs) And you read that and you said, this is me. And just reading that and internalizing it helped you from that point forward. Yeah. That was a turning point. Right. And now I go to coaching training and they go, you don't have to be who you think you have to be. Who you've been for the last almost 50 years doesn't have to define you going forward hmm. i was like wow and they said something there which i think about all the time what i say to you is about me what you hear me say is about you wow, wow. say that one more time i like that so it's perception i'm in a bad place right and i'm having a bad day and i'm going to take it out and i say something to you that's supposed to be derogatory or whatever because I'm having a bad day, I'm projecting it onto you. Yeah. Now it's up to you to decide how to take it. Now, how you say it to me could be I'm having a great day and you're an idiot and I don't care. Or I'm not really having a good day and you're attacking me personally. So I'm going to go back. Yes. You determine the meaning of the communication. All right. So let me repeat that so everybody gets it. So what yes. I say to you is about me. What you hear me say is about you. Write that down, guys. That's a good one. Uh, And if you're driving, write it down later. So (laughs) let me let me ask you, because I want to talk about these challenges, because those are two very large challenges consecutively that occurred in your life. Okay, one that caused the things to be taken away from you. And the second caused a love in your life to be removed. right? Right. So let me ask you this. If you could go back to 2008 when you experienced that first hit, right? What advice would this Martin who made it through that time, who is creating so many great things in the world now, right? But you wouldn't know that if you went back 13, 14, 15 years, what advice would you give to Martin in 2008? (sighs) When everything was falling apart, when everything happened and it was on my way down, I would like, Look at the situation and try to figure out how you can remove yourself emotionally from what's going on so that you can have a clearer view of what to do next. What would you have said to that advice? Would you have taken it? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) The, The reason I ask is because there's a lot of people right now and I know them personally, I'm thinking of one person in particular, who they are facing a challenge in their life right now. And it's very similar to the divorce that you mentioned. And they are attempting to redefine themselves. And they are worried and they are exhausted and they're feeling this constant tiredness in their life. How can that person go from that state of worry to becoming a warrior themselves? Yeah. So they have to first, you know, there's another part of my cards that I talk about, which is a three card set that starts off with the first card or or the, the, the promo card is admission, cleansing and celebration. Okay. Right. So admission is admit the way you're living now is not working. So give yourself permission. And I, somebody had just gotten these cards while I was away last week. We were together for four or five days at a conference and she bought it on the first or second day. And she came back to me on the fourth day and she said, oh my God, I'm on that first card. Thank you for giving me permission to admit what's not working for me. So admission is saying that once you've made that declaration to yourself, you can no longer have to look back and try to fix, figure out what went wrong or how you can fix the past. You admit that you're ready to move on with your life and you begin the process of cleansing, mm. right? And then cleansing is doing the work to change those things. And celebration is, for example, let's say you decide you need to lose 50 pounds. Yep. Instead of celebrating when you hit 50 pounds, celebrate when you lose two pounds, five pounds, 
along the way. So it's, it goes for anything. Celebrate those little victories along the way. Yeah. That's powerful. It's simple framework, but powerful. Just to repeat that, give yourself permission to accept what's not working in your life. So that is a form of awareness, like you mentioned earlier, right? Yeah. And then the yep. second is then cleanse and do the work to get yourself out of that situation. But that at the same time requires a level of focus and clarity of what situation you in fact do want right. in your life. Right. And, and to be honest, that's where coaching comes in. Okay. Right. Because as a coach, if somebody comes to me and they go, okay, I, I know I got to do things. I admit it. And we go through this part of here and we go through that. And, and what's great about a coach is number one, if, if you're doing it right, you're finding someone that's not emotionally attached to you. Yes. Right. Because you need to have somebody who can be objective and supportive without judgment. Coaching is about no, no judgment. Right. And it's very easy. Even if you found somebody that's emotionally attached, even if they're not judging, you think they are. Because you have a relationship with that person of some sort. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, it's like you always think your parents are judging you, your wife is judging you, whoever is judging you in your life. You have siblings. I mean, I have four older sisters. I always think they're judging me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the it's only just, boy. It's just part of family. life. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So by having a coach who's going to hold you accountable, that's the other thing. You come to them, you talk about what's going on. And then you go, okay, great. Where are we moving from here? Right. What are your goals? The thing about a coach that people ha sometimes have a difficult time recognizing is that we're not therapists. Therapists take you from dysfunctional to functional. Coaches take you from functional to optimal. Right. Because in therapy, you can't get out of your own way and you keep on beating yourself up. Right. So the therapist will give you techniques, give you things to change along the way. Now, coaches can do that, too. But it starts with coaches mostly asking questions yep. and letting the person figure it out on their own with your you, the coach, giving them suggestions, giving them, you know, having brainstorming, whatever. Yeah, I found I found something very similar. I found therapy, and I will just say I've never gone to therapy, although I definitely understand there's much value in therapy from people there who is. have gone, right? There I is. found therapy to be a, an unfocused form of self-help, a, a way of – they ask questions as well, you know, more on the emotional side of things, more on helping someone pinpoint what the problem is. Not even what the problem is, right? The language there is important, but I found coaching to be very focused on a specific result or an outcome that someone's looking to have in their life or their business or whatever it might be. And I found value in, in people having both of those things at once, right? right? right a therapist right. and a coach. So for the person who is worried and they, they're, they're saying to themselves, Martin, I want to feel better. I want to enjoy my life. I want to live my life. Again, your three-step process there, give yourself permission to accept what's not working and then cleanse and do the work and then celebrate the little victories. I feel a lot of people, miss out on that third piece to celebrate. 100%, the they just keep going. Next, they, next, they, next. They're looking for the instant gratification. They're looking to get to the finish line from the starting line. Yeah. You know, they forget that there's a journey in between. <laughs> yeah. Right. And here's the other thing. If you get from the begin, the start to the finish in one second or in a quick time, it's not sustainable. Eventually you will go back to your personal, your old tendencies you know, habits take at least 21 days to change, right? And why not change them with positive habits? Mm -hmm. if there are good things as good ha There are things as good habits. <laughs> you know, people don't think that, but if you get up a day every day and exercise, that's a good habit. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you've mentioned this idea of living an incredibly full life, right? So let so, me show you where that came from. Now I know I've been, we've been picking up. Yeah. There. So now I go through coaching and I become a divorce recovery coach. Makes sense. I was co I had just yeah. recovered from divorce. Yeah. And now a few years later, I look at myself and I'm the heaviest I've ever been. Why? Because I lost everything. I'm now back and living in Brooklyn and I have a dead end job other than my coaching, which isn't paying very much. Yes. And the dead end job is making me think, oh, I'm never going to get out of this. Now I'm coaching people, but I'm not being coached. Why? 
because the money that I was making wasn't enough. So I couldn't afford it. And then finally, I looked in the mirror one day. I was the heaviest I ever was. I'm like, how the heck did I get here? Because I made decisions that made me get here. So I need to make decisions that will turn me around. So I said, a friend of mine was on Facebook touting this 30-minute video you could do at home. I'm like, 30 minutes? Okay, well, I go to work at 7. I get home at 7. Maybe if I woke up a little earlier, I did the 30 minutes, and then took a shower and got ready for work, just as I was going to do every other day. I started doing that. And the first couple of weeks, I got to tell you, it was the hardest thing because I'm following the moderated person on the video and I'm up chucking because it's been so long since I've worked out. I had no <laughs> energy, but I had my why. My why was that I needed to feel better. I needed to look better. I needed to lose the weight. Yeah. And over nine months, I lost 65 pounds. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah, man. Well done, why? man. Because I worked out. I was eating right. I was reading right. And I was allowing myself to be coached by the guy on the video, coached by the guy that brought me in here and coached by others. I found other ways to get coached because I realized it was an investment in myself to get coached. It wasn't a cost. Yes. All right. So now everything's going great. I'm loving my life. I This is where I really made the switch from self-conscious to self-aware. Right. I was exercising. I was doing everything. I was now I'm ADHD. So I was also doing things like meditating. Could you imagine an ADHD guy meditating? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. But I was doing <laughs> like the uh, guided meditation headspace, you know, uh, app. And I had a great voice. And I'd listen. I'm like, when is this going to be over? Mm-hmm. And why can't I think, not think about anything? Why is everything going up in my head? But one of these days I was doing this, I had this download of information. And after I finished this this thing of, of meditating for 10 minutes, I wrote for two hours. Wow. And out of that, I wrote, I love my life and I want to show other people how to enjoy it too. Now I have a thing about acronyms. I think acronyms help people remember things. Yes. So I took the word life and I said, okay, let me turn it into an acronym. And I came up with, this is the way I'm, I'm living my life now and I want to live my life forever. L-I-F-E. Mm-hmm. Live incredibly full every day. So now when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I write down three things in a journal that I'm grateful for. And then I pray, pray to God. And then I say, I live incredibly full every day. Now I'm wrecked for the day. I'm set for the day. And if things come up that are, could be negative, I'm going to look for the positive in it, or I'm going to defer to deflect it as much as I can and not let my personal feelings get involved so that I can make, I can respond instead of react. Well said. Thank yeah. You. I love that. I love that ritual. The idea of you wake up and you've, you've got this set of things that you do each day. Do you find yourself, is there a day that you don't do them or are you doing them every day? Uh, pretty much every day. And okay. if, 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 if I skip one day, it's one of them, it's not the worst thing, but if it's a few days, I start to see myself starting to look at things differently. Yes. Like, wait a minute. Why am I doing that? How, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I haven't been doing my things that are keeping me grounded. So now I start dating, right? And I have this whole different mindset because one of the things I learned through going through coach training is, is values. And looking at them, I realize what my values are. And I look back and I realize my ex-wife and I never had the same values. Mm. And that probably led to the codependency and all that. Now, I'll be honest with you. I have four beautiful children. We had many, many good years. But the day she asked me for the divorce, other than my four, good, my four children, I'd say that was the greatest gift she ever gave me. Wow. Now because you're able made to see me that. look within myself. Yes. Right? So now I'm dating. And I'm going out with these women and they don't even realize they're being interviewed on their values because I'm asking them questions which are value-based for me to get this understand. Do I want to continue dating this woman? You know, when you're in your 50s, you're not dating for, for fun. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Know? Yes. And one day I, I met this woman. I, w- I was actually set up with her. Uh, and we start going out and she's checking every box. And another day goes by, she's checking every box. A month into it, I said, I got to tell you something. And I don't need to hear it from you, but I need to tell it to you. I'm falling in love with you 
because I love who you see and I love that you see me exactly as I am and you're not trying to change me. Uh -huh. Right? So two weeks later, she told me she loved me and two years later, we got married and we've been married for almost five years. Oh, congratulations, brother. Thank That's you. beautiful. But now 2020 happens and the world is going nuts, right? Everybody's worried about everything going on in the world. And it's March 1st. At first, it happens in March. And they go, it's going to be three weeks. And then we'll go back to normal. Now we're in the middle of May and it's still, everything's basically locked down. Mm -hmm. My wife and I look at each other on a Sunday morning. We go, let's drive to the city. We take her kids and we drive to the city. Now, if you know New York City, driving straight up 6th Avenue takes a long time. Oh, yeah. So imagine I'm driving straight up 6th Avenue and I make every traffic light. <laughs> it took I like two turn, minutes. Right. I drive down 5th Avenue and I make every stop. We stop at on, on Museum Mile. We stop in front of the, the this museum, that museum. The kids are getting out and taking pictures. We're getting back. And I turn to my wife and go, What's going on? Where is everybody? Why is everybody so worried? And we're not. And I realized the last 15 years or less 12, 12, 12, at that point, it was like 12 years had prepared me. 2008, I lost everything. Then my divorce, then my weight journey and my coming up and understanding that I don't have to worry about everything. I get onto Facebook and I go, guys, I get it. I know why you're worried. And let me show you how to go from being a warrior to a warrior. Wow. And that's where the warrior's life code came from. What an awesome story, man. Awesome story. I love how we, I love how we weaved in some of these lessons into the story itself. And I think it's really important to say that, you know, we're not saying when you have a challenge, immediately get yourself out of that challenge, get yourself out of that state of mind. Like if you didn't have those challenges, Martin, you wouldn't be where you are today. If if you weren't, if you didn't go through that divorce, you wouldn't have now found your now wife. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, no. if you hadn't met your first wife, you wouldn't have your four children, right? Things right, would be very exactly. different. No, hundred percent. I, I don't, I don't regret the past. Yeah. What is it going to do me to regret the past anyway? Am I going to be able to change it? Do I have a time machine where I can go back and say, oh, Martin, you know, your brother passed away or, or get down the block a week, a, a few minutes earlier and stop him from, from getting hit by the, by the bus. By the way, in about two weeks, it'll be 50 years since that happened. Wow. Yeah. But we can't do that. We can't go back in time and change history. So having regrets isn't going to do anything. I had 25 years of marriage. We were officially married 25 years. Many of them were good. Yes. You and know, you know, so a lot of people. The baby out with the bathwater. Whoops. Yeah. I, I may be dropping my cell phone, but <laughs> well, let me tell you a lot of people, I like, I, again, I'm thinking of someone else now who I, I, I love dearly in my life. They're a great friend of mine and they just got out of a very short term relationship. And this individual, they continue to say things such as I wasted six months of my life and not the case, but it's hard for me to now say, well, think about all the things you've learned during this time. Think about yeah, the, yeah. they're you know, too emotionally the charged. Experience. <laughs> exactly. So that idea of not regretting the past, it's it's easier said than done. But when you take a step back and you look at how you grew during that sense of time, like like you is perfect example, 25 years, a lot of people. And I, again, I know someone else I think of who was married for a long time. They got divorced and they said, well, I don't want to do that again. And they never go on to find that new connection. Right. Right. And I'm not saying force yourself into a new connection, but you obviously knew there was a time where you said, I want a new love in my life in some shape, form, or capacity. And right. you went and you went after it and you made mm -hmm. it happen. Even though you spent a decade and a half of your life with someone else, you still took the initiative to create that new connection to start a new chapter. Right. Right. And and you know what? It had to do with going through and being divorce recovery coach. I recognize that if I was going to go and find somebody, if I didn't do the work on myself, I would blame her for the entire marriage or myself for the entire marriage being uh, 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 falling apart. We were both to blame. We were both victims and we were both uh, culprits to the, to, to the demise of the marriage. But that being said, I then had to figure out what works for me and what didn't. What was my contributions, positive and negative? And if I don't fix myself, I'll end up marrying somebody 
exactly like my first wife in a different body. <laughs> yes. And what good is that? That's exactly. why two thirds of second marriages end in divorce. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going strong, my friend. Five years. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. It's a long time, brother. That's a long yeah. time. So, so let me ask you and to congratulate you as well on your upcoming book, which is encompassing everything we talked about today so far, yeah. Warrior to Warrior. And it's launching at some point, April, maybe May, but we, you know, when they go Something to your website, they can, right? they can pre-order the book right now when they go mm -hmm. to your website. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. What if, For those listening who might not be going to the description, what is your website they can find that at? So I came up with a website that gives you an opportunity to buy the cards, pre-order the book, and also get some free gifts. I call it connectwithmartin.com. Oh, that's great. It's very easy to remember. It is. Connectwithmartin.com. Right. So talk to me about the, the book. It's self-explanatory. It's a book. People can open it. People can read it. Talk right. to me about this card deck that you created. Why, why the card deck and how do people actually use it? Because you showed us a few during this. For those mm -hmm. watching, Martin flashed the cards on the screen here. They look really great. But why okay, I was cards? only flashing cards. I wasn't flashing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> so here it is again. Okay. The Warrior to Warrior card deck. And uh, what it is basically is taking my techniques, my systems, and putting them into bite size. So if you're somebody who's never taken the course, you can read this and get an idea of what the course is like and an idea of how you could start the process. Okay? Now, if you have taken the course, which is it's called Warrior to Warrior course as well, then you can go back and say, wait a minute, I'm struggling today. What card do I need to help me that I worked on in the course to help me get back on track. And the book is a larger version of this. It goes into the history. It gives you it, uh, my history. It goes, gives you success stories. There's stories along the whole way that go deeper. That's great. Yeah. It's a different form of going through the same process in a different way. Right. Exactly. Because you know what? Having the cards it gives you a more tangible way of on a daily basis saying, wait a minute, let me pull out the cards and say, well, what do I need today? You know, there are some people who told me I, I read a card a day. And it's like my, come some, and they're broken down to different categories, but like one of them has in it affirmations. Another one is a, a way of looking at, you know, how the day is going out and you have a, uh, 20 different affirmations that you could say, I am open and ready to be positive. The warrior mindset, I'm in control of my feelings, so on and so forth, that you can say to yourself to get you ready for the day. That's great. I love that. Guys, you, you heard it here. Martin's got his card deck. You can check out on his website, connectwithmartin.com, as well as his, his upcoming book, Warrior to Warrior. Again, for those listening, you can find that and pre-order that book at connectwithmartin.com. Links are also in the description. Martin, you have an electrifying energy about you. You're a positive guy. <laughs> you're a you. funny guy. And I think that's very important. We get a lot of people who who they've got the know-how, they've got the story, but they're just, they don't have that humor and that spark. And you Thank bring you. that, brother. So this has been a very fun conversation. I do have one last question for you if you're up for it. Yeah. What's the next chapter look like for you in this in this next part of your life? That's a great question. For me, it's about getting my message out to millions and for them to understand that the, the mindset is in their own control. They can go from a mindset of lack to a mindset of abundance. They can go from a mindset of self-consciousness, self-conscious to a mindset of self-aware. And if I can help millions of people get there, then, then that's what my next chapter looks like. Oh, I'm excited to see how you work through that chapter, my friend. I know you'll do it, and I'm excited to hear all about your book launching. Thanks for coming on the show to talk about it and for sharing your journey, my friend. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brandon. I love being here with you. You heard it here, guys. We talked about everything from people-pleasing, uh, how Martin was a recovering people pleaser himself and is a recovering people pleaser and, and how I relate to that story as well. And I'm sure you can at the same time. We talked about the three-step process to move from warrior to a warrior right? To give you a quick recap, that's to give yourself permission to accept that what's going on 
you're not happy with in your life. The second part is to cleanse and actually do the work to work through that time, right? And that can be difficult. And that's why having a coach can be super important to help you find clarity and help you find focus during that time. And the third piece is to celebrate small victories along the way. If you want to lose, like Martin said, he lost 60 pounds within nine months. If you lose five pounds of that, celebrate. Maybe not with a Big Mac, maybe something a little bit more constructive, but celebrate the small victories. And Martin's book, coming up warrior to warrior encapsulates everything we talked about and we'll give you the bird's eye view and the deep view on everything that we talked about today i hope you love this episode again you can find everything about martin and his upcoming book at connect with martin.com links are in the description if you enjoyed this conversation share this show with just one other person who could use it. We've grown significantly in the last six months alone because you're the best part of the Be Better team. More people are listening to the podcast and it is a beautiful thing. So I'm grateful to you for being the best part of the Be Better team. Thanks so much for watching and listening. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.